For today's quiz, I've got this thrust bearing and it's got races on top and bottom and there's little balls that fit in between here. They're half inch uh, and we make a ball bearing. This is a thrust bearing, can handle huge loads. I have a drawn here. You can see the individual uh, balls in the race here and there's a groove that they ride along. Our question for today simply asks, if I've got 18 in there right now, what would happen to the number of rotations if I were to give this a spin and let it wind down to zero, if I removed one bearing at a time. Here's what your quiz looks like. It's behind me now. There's your bearing. There's the 18 bearings. Although I don't actually have 18 drawn in there, it's good enough. As always, write your explanation to the best of your ability and list your level of confidence. Typical student responses are, look, we've already seen your other video, and we know that when you ended up taking bearings out, it ended up spinning for a longer period of time. That's good and good thinking. However, we're asking about the number of rotations. Students are still going to say, well, I still think as I take the number of bearings out, it'll get uh, a greater number of rotations. A few holdouts will still say, no, as I have more bearings here, it's more stable, less chance of it falling apart. And so they might end up saying uh, more is more stable. But the vast majority at this point are going to say as we decrease the number of the spheres in here, it's going to end up rotating further and further, uh, a greater number of rotations than when it's completely filled here. All right, let's not belabor the point on this, but stick around after. This is part of our long-term uh, project uh, that we're working on. But regardless, when I have all 18 bearings in here, they really are rubbing up against one another. So uh, they're so tightly uh, side by side here. When I take this off, I'm going to remove just one bearing and then I'll put this race back on top. And now you can see it moves much more freely. And in fact, if I were to take another one of these off like this, I'm just going to drop it so I don't have to worry about it because I don't want to lose control of this. You can see it spins even more. And I'll knock another one of these off and get the race back on. Spins freer and freer. As I knock each one of these off, I get more rotations for a given spin. Now, oh, a whole bunch just fell off there. And we'll see, look, it spins longer and longer and longer. And eventually we get down to three. Three is gonna be the longest. However, um, three does have a stability problem. All right, that's essentially your quiz for today. But again, stick around. We're gonna go in uh, much greater depth. This is a pretty um, shoddy way of trying to uh, find an answer. We're gonna now uh, quantitatively come up with a better system, even better than we did last time. So stick around. All right, I wanna explain uh, how we're going to get better data um, than we did just by counting last time. See, I was spinning it by hand last time, and it's hard to know if I was spinning it the same way. I tried really hard, but I, I really don't know if it was exact. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a photo gate this time. And the photo gate is just going to uh, count every time the beam is blocked. You'll see that little red light right there as I put my finger back through it. I'll put a toothpick on this race, and... I'll spin it around and it'll go through the photo gate. It'll measure the time and the number of times it goes through there. Now, uh, that should give us, uh, you know, really reliable data to help us take care of, am I spinning it the same way? I'll spin it faster than I need to. And once I get down to a certain rate, then I'll start counting at that point for each and every run. And then I'll remove one of these balls each time and do the same spin starting again once I hit whatever arbitrary rate that I pick. All right, we're ready to go here. I have five bearings put in this race right here. I've got my computer set up. Here's my photo gate right here. And every time I go through here, it's going to end up collecting data. I have a toothpick coming out. So I'll just give this a pretty good spin. I'll hit collect and then I'll spin this.
another side and I'll take a value, I'll pick some arbitrary value, maybe like 0.3 that we'll start this at and let this continue all the way out. That's when I'll hit stop and then we'll hit this stat button over here. And it looks like that was the last one. I'll hit, well, maybe one more. I'll hit stop. So I'll end up zooming in on this and I'll pick the value that says 0.3. I'm just gonna use an arbitrary value of 0.3 so I'll click on these and see where I'm at, 0.26, and then I'll go to 0.28. Let's get to 0 0.3, 0 0.30, that looks good. Uh, as soon as it hits 0 0.30, that'll be our rule. So we'll go one further than that one. So I'll click off here, and I'll go down and I'll start on this one, and I'll highlight everything all the way over. Hopefully I'm not in the way here. And then I can hit my View Stats button. And this is the important part. It's gonna say that, look, it went for 21.619 seconds. So now we've got a really accurate value of how long this was spinning for. And remember, it's starting there. It's not starting all the way back. And we had a total of 40 samples. So I can do this for each and every one. Maybe I'll do two trials of each. Maybe I'll do another one very quickly after I write that down. All right, I've collected some data. Really, I've collected an awful lot of data. This took uh, quite a bit of time. You'll notice that I have the number of spheres in the races there. Uh, we can call them balls, but the problem is, as a teacher, if you end up saying balls in class, you have young men that kind of uh, get giddy about this, and uh, you can avoid that. So I call them ball bearings. Uh, now, mechanical engineers, you're going to, of course, comment that this is a bearing altogether, and the individual pieces are the balls. Uh, but again, I'm going to call them ball bearings, and that's why. Regardless, I ended up starting at 17. Look, when I have 17 of these, they actually rotate, as we could see. Remember, I showed you when I had 18 in here, they don't move at all. There's too much friction. We explained that on the uh, first video. Um, and so these were going pretty quick, 12 seconds, and I ended up doing it for uh, three trials. So I have time one, time two, and time three. And if you recall, it also told me the number of rotations. Well, these went really quick, so I was like, I'll just do three trials for each. So I ended up doing uh, about nine seconds, eight seconds, and about seven seconds, right? It didn't take that long. Well, remember, as we went up, I should say, as we decreased the number of spheres in the bearing, um, my times got much greater. So they were taking about a minute and a half each. And when you're doing trial after trial, it really adds up. Uh, what we can clearly see, though, is that as we decrease the number of bearings, balls in this race, our times go up and so do our rotations. One of the things that I wanted to, to see also is, on our first video, I was just giving these a twist with my hand, and I wanted to see how, you know, accurate was that. Well, I took all of my uh, times and my rotations, so here I have my average times. I just take the three and add them, divide by three. And then I put from my last video, uh, what was the twist that I gave and how many uh, seconds was that going? Well, it turns out that they were pretty close. Look, my average of the three that I did today are 82 and the test from the first video uh, was 80. And then 53 to 54, 40, six to 47. So that original methodology that I felt I was doing a pretty good job, looks like I did. All right, so what uh, we can find here is that the number of rotations and the time that it's rotating going around uh, both increase as you decrease the number of uh, balls in the ball bearing. Uh, maybe I'll make this into a graph because it's one thing to say, of course, it's going to increase or decrease, but how does it do so? So I'm going to end up making a graph since I already have the numbers here. So give me a minute. Okay, I've graphed all of our data, and you can see this is the bearing time, how long it spins. Now remember, in order to keep these fair, I always waited till they went down to um, a value of 0.3 on the time, which technically was the period that it took to go around. Um, and then I would count them from there. Turns out that I was pretty much always giving each one of these about that much, but some were more difficult than others. When I had 
a full bearing like this, there's great stability. One of the things that I found out. As I got to three bearings, which of course is gonna end up having the longest period of time, um, it is the hardest to get started. There's an instability about it, but uh, at the same time, it seems to go for way, way longer, as we can see here. So the amount of time as the bearings decrease, increases. At the same time, we could see that the number of rotations nearly follow suit. You could see both of these look like they have maybe a, an inverse function or something like that. And I was not quite expecting that. And I need to think about why that is. Uh, what I do know is every time two of these bearings are uh, touching their neighbor, you're gonna end up having this compounding effect. And I think that's what we see here. By the time I get to three bearings, it's really hard for two of them to ever touch. But many of them, many of them touch uh, when they're nearly full, like uh, 16, 15, 14, something like that. So um, either way, we can see that they both share a very similar pattern, and we answered our quiz for today. But all of this, really anyone can do. I mean, what, what have I really done? I've decreased the number of ball bearings, and I've simply tested the time and rotation. It's interesting in itself, but that doesn't make a great long term. Here's what does. As I was doing this, and I've spent a lot of time on this, collecting all that data, when I would have these rolling, you start to notice a lot of things. For instance, first thing that I noticed, if I did not have these perfectly level, and I had to make sure the table was level, they tend to self-destruct quickly. So there's a claim that I'm gonna investigate. But more interesting is when I had this going around, I could hear differences. And I'll put this up to the uh, mic side and see if you can hear. That one didn't do it, but you can hear occasionally the bearings are gonna smack into one another. And when they do that, I can tell it's gonna be what I'm gonna claim is a less efficient run. I think it's gonna go slower. Some of your energy is going into the balls smacking into one another. I don't know if you can hear them in there. That means they're not all supporting the load on top here. So my uh, next idea is the claim that I can tell the efficiency of a ball bearing by its sound. Now that makes a really, really awesome long term, something that I'm gonna get into. So as we go through these, we're gonna end up going a little bit further and you end up finding other more interesting stuff. Some of the other little details that I hadn't thought of before is when I ended up having uh, these going for a longer period of time and I showed you that original graph and I would collect the data, it was hard to find exactly where that 0.3 mark was, the 0.3 seconds, uh, because there were so many data points in there. And if I wanted to do this quickly, harder than I thought. So uh, we're gonna end up going on with this bearing series but for day, for, we'll just say for today, that's your quiz. And we'll say that's the next installment of our long term on the bearing. All right. Thank you for watching another Idealized Science Institute video. We are a nonprofit organization. If you like what you've seen, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want, leave a comment below. It's helpful to us. If you can financially support us, go to our website and hit the donate button. If you can't, simply by sharing these videos with other teachers and students in your life will be helpful. While at our website, you'll find that we have our Idealized Science Institute book that'll help you engage your students in dialogic discourse. There you'll also find we have a podcast where we break down educational research. We also have long form lessons. If you're a teacher, you can watch these and go in the very next day and enact these. Along with this, we also have many other resources, including more quick quizzes. So thank you for watching and we hope to see you in the next one.